Welcome to Lemons.com and our lab video series on MPLS. You can find a complete list of MPLS videos on our website by clicking on the link above and sign up for our newsletters to receive the latest video updates. In this video, we're going to look at how to provide a share of common services to MPLS VPN sites, and this includes internet. We're first going to put these services in a default VRF. For the next lab video, we are going to create a dedicated VRF for this and see how much different that would be. And some of the features that we'll be touching in this video is our VRF selection with policy-based routings and VRF aware NAT. For our physical lab topologies, we have eight routers, R1 through R8 and one switch, switch one. With R2, R3, R4, R5 are connected over the serial point to point links while the other routers are connected over the layer two VLANs. Okay, for our layer three topology in the middle, we have our MPLS core with R1, R2 and R4 being the provider edge or PE routers and the router R3, R5 being the P router. Okay, we already have some of the MPLS VPN sites configured. For our two customers, the customer VRFC1 with the site 1 and 4 being a part of or belongs to the customer, and the second customer with VRFC2s at site 2. Okay, all of these are running PECE routing protocols, which is BGP that we're using here, and we just happen to use the same AS number for all of them, which is 65124. Okay, so site number three here, we have removed the VRF from our previous lab, and now it's just running off the default VRF on the global routing table. This is where we're going to be hosting our share services. As we will see in a minute, we go through our tasks. So we're going to use our loopback 10 to simulate a share of common services, and this could be things like DNS servers that's being provided by the provider or a SIP trunk service. Okay, at the same time, we have our loopback 42 that we're going to be using to simulate our internet. So we're going to try to provide internet to all of our customer or MBLS VPN sites in this lab as well. All right, so let's take a look at our scenario here. There is a share services subnet on switch one. We just show you that those are the loopback 10 on switch one that needs to be accessed by multiple VPN sites, site one, two, and four. So for configuration task number one with share services, we need to configure our four and switch one to allow R6, R7, R8 to access switch one loopback 10 from their loopback 10 through 12. Okay, a use of static routes is allow. And since there is no address overlapping between site one, two, and four, the share services must be accessed using the site true IP. So there will be no network address translation involved in this particular task. Okay, so let's bring back up the diagram. So what, what we're gonna try to do here is to make this particular loopback available to site one, site two, and site four among the two customers that we have, C1 and C2. But just keep in mind that this particular site three right here, or the loopback is located on the global routing table. So somehow we're gonna have to get the VRF traffic out of the VRF into the global routing table and then uh, back into the VRFs as well. So we're gonna see in a minute how we're gonna be able to achieve that. But at the same time, for the return traffic to work, that means R4 right here has to be able to import all of the customer's routing tables into the local VRF. So what we're gonna have to be doing also is to create all of the VRF that needs access to the service, and these include C1 and C2 on R4. And also, once the traffic return traffic hits switch one, switch one needs to know how to get back to all of these uh, router loopbacks. So we're going to have to configure static routes since we're not currently not running dynamic routing protocol between the P and the CE. So we're just going to configure just to keep things simple, a bunch of static routes pointing back to all of these routers. So let's start off with that. So on the switch one, we're going to have to add static routes. So let's so on the switch one. Config T IP route. So first to the R6 loopback 10 through 12. This loopback is 6600, 10, uh, and 20. So we're going to do 6600. And we can just keep it simple, do a slash 16 on that. And then the next hop is going to be 172 16104.4, which is the R4 fast 00 interface. And then just name it something like R6. Okay, next we're gonna configure static route for R7 and then R8. 
Okay, now moving on to the configuration on the router R4, we mentioned that we're going to have to create all of the VRF that needs to access the chair services or R4 as a knowledge of those remote routes. So getting over to R4, first we're going to create VRF C1. And that VRF, we're currently using a RD of 100, 100. And to be able to fully exchange the routes to all of the sites that's part of C1, we can just add the route target of 100, 100. Okay, as you can see, because that's the route target that that particular VRF is using. And the other one is for C2, so IP VRF C2. RD for this one is going to be 200, 200, and then same thing with the route target. Okay, so at this point, we do show IP, BGP, VPN, V4. R4 should be learning all the routes from R6 and R7, and also R8 right here for the VRFC2. Okay, so next we're going to try and to get the traffic out of the VRF, so any traffic that's coming from these VRF, once it hits R4, R4 has to pass it to the global routing tail because it's where the share services are located. In other words, we're going to have to try to leak the routes from the VRF into the global routing table. And the way to do that, we can use a static route. So do an IP route, and that route is going to have to be part of the VRF. So first we're going to do VRF C1, okay, and that particular service network or subnet is 10.10.0.0 so 10.10.0.0 slash 24 and the next hop from R4 it's going to be the switch to and that is 162.16.104.10 which is the interface right here okay so that's the next hop from R4 and then we're going to have to enter the global option Okay, just to indicate that the next top is part of the global routing table. So we enter global and we can just name it service. We're going to use pretty much the exact same IP route statement, but this time it's going to be in the VRFC2. Okay, so if we do show IP route VRFC1 static, you will see the static route. It's in there as well as the VRFC2. Okay, so now once the, the traffic hits R4, R4 will know exactly that it needs to forward that to the uh, using the global routing table. Okay, so so far we don't have the static routes for the shared services subnet in the R4 routing table. Now we have to advertise that into BGP so the remote PE routers has a knowledge of that subnet. So we're going to be redistributing that static route into the corresponding BGP address family VRF. Okay, so first getting under router BGP 100, address family for VRFC1, and we're just going to keep it simple using redistribute static. And then we do a VRFC2, and then we also do redistribute statics. Okay, just to do a quick check, if we hop over to R1 and do show IP BGP, VPN V4 all, then we should be able to see right here. Actually, we can see both for C1 and C2, they're both now learning the shared services subnet from the router R4. Okay, so we know that redistribution work can take a note that the route origin is also uh, incomplete, which is the result of the redistribution. Okay, so that's for the traffic in the upstream direction that's towards the services. Now, for the return traffic that has or that's coming from a default VRF and needs to be insert it into the correct VRF. The way to do that, we're going to use a feature call. Here is VRF selection with the policy-based routing. So what we're going to do is to come up with an access list and route maps that will match to a certain type of traffic based on destination IP addresses. So that the, the addresses will define which VRF the traffic needs to be inserted into. Okay, so first we need to come up with a access list to match the traffic. So first we do uh, IP access list. Let's call this one 2C1. So this will be for the VRFC1. And we have to match the traffic doing permit IP. We don't care about the source and we can lock it down. We can just use any. 
and then in, we could say any traffic that going towards R6, which is part of C1, and there's IP address 6600, we can just do slash 16 again, and we do the similar ACL entry for the router R7 as well. So any traffic that's going towards R6 and R7 basically, and we can only do this when there's no overlapping IP addresses on the VPN or MPLS VPN sites, and we don't have any overlapping IPs. And then we're gonna later on define that this type of traffic is gonna have to be placed into the VRFC one. Okay, now we're gonna do the same thing for 2C2. Do permit IP any to router R8 loopback 255. Okay, now we'll come up with the route map and we're going to call it from the global routing table sequence uh, permit 10. We're going to match IP address utilizing the ACL we just configured to C1, so matching any traffic going towards R6 and R7. We're going to do a set command and we're going to push that into the VRF C1. Okay. Next for the VRFC2, we're going to match IP address to C2, and then we're going to set VRFC2. Okay, so you can see that the configuration process is very similar to configuring a policy-based routing. That's what is called a VRF selection using PBR. And to complete that, we're going to have to tie our route map to a incoming interface. So that's going to be inbound or ingress of fast zero zero. So we'll get under fast zero zero and following the PBR syntax, there will be an IP policy route map. Just make sure to have a typo and just copy and paste. So from global. Okay, so make sure everything looks correct and just show route map. And here we have our route map from global. Okay, we also want to do an IP VRF receive just to Activate that on the VRF C1 and C2. Okay, so that should be all the configuration that we need since now we have defined how the traffic will be leaving our forward to the shared services as well as the traffic coming back. Okay, and we have made sure that all the route has been advertised to all of the sites. So just to test, we can get on to router R6 and then do a ping to 10.10.0.1, which is the loopback address on switch one right here, loopback 10, and the source it from loopback 10 of R6. Okay, you can see that it is pingable. Let's try the same thing on R7. That's working, and then R8, you can see that it's working as well. Okay, so now going back to R4 and just look around for a little bit. So first, if you do show access list, you can see that each of the ACS entry that we have here has five matches. So those corresponds to the five ping success that we had. Okay, and if you do show route map, again, very similar to PBR, you will see the packet counts and byte counts here as well. So we know that the return traffic, in fact, matches our route map and gets routed and inserted to the appropriate VRF. Okay, so that's how you can provide share services to your MPLS VPN sites using the default VRF. And again, this is only possible when you do not have a overlapping IPs amongst the remote site. Otherwise, when it leaves R4, it becomes within the same a global routing table and wouldn't know how to get back if you have the overlapping IPs. And that should complete our task number one.